sweet Lord, my Lord, my, my Lord, I really want to see you, I really want to be with you, I really want to see you, Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord, my sweet Lord. Lord, I really want to know you, I really want to go with you, I really want to show you, Lord, that it won't take long, my Lord, my, my Lord, my Lord, my sweet Lord. Today is the fourth week in our series, I Am, You Are. Uh, do you have your keys from last week? Do you have your key? Uh, if you have it, keep it with you. Bring it next week. You'll find out why. Uh, the keys are a reminder that we are doors uh, for people to find out about God through us. Um, you can get uh, keys if you don't have one in the, at the info table after the service. Today, our focus uh, this morning is on Jesus' statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's a phrase that sets Jesus apart and makes us wonder about a world where many people maybe don't feel the same way. And if you're like me, you probably have questions about that. So we'll have time for questions with our guests, Mariam Muhammad and Abdi Salam Adam. And you can write those on the sticky notes that are in your Sunday paper uh, and pass those to the people that are that we'll be walking around to collect those, or you can send a text message to the number that will be on the screen. It's the same as last week. Um, also, in your Sunday paper is a communication card. We ask that everybody fill these out. It's a great way to let us know that you were here. Uh, no one's going to call you unless you want them to. Uh, it's a way to send in prayer requests uh, or if you have any questions or comments. Um, lastly, a couple quick announcements. Jacob's Well is growing. Uh, we've had a couple bursts this last week. Jacob from the band and his wife Jess welcomed yeah. little Freddie last week. And Gina, our organizational architect, and her husband James welcomed baby Gabriella last Sunday. Nice. 
And as you can see by Nate's shirt, uh, he's going to be getting married in a couple weeks, oh, or man. months, a couple months, right? So, <laughs> so congratulations to all of them. And uh, if you'll join me in a quick prayer, we'll get started. God of all people, all times, and all places, we call upon your presence now. Be with us, and let your spirit move among us, drawing us closer to you, opening our hearts to the wonder of your world and your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. The world's shaking with the love of God. Great and glorious, let the whole earth sing. All you ever do, and all you ever do, is change the earth for new we believe that God is bigger than the air I breathe. The world will be if God will say today, and all will say, My glory. Breaking heavens come to earth. The hearts awakening, let the church bells ring. And all you ever do, and all you ever do, is change the earth for you. We believe that God is bigger than the air I breathe, the world will live, and God will save the day, and all will say, my glory, my glorious, my glory.
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You can have a seat for a second. Wow, some pretty challenging questions, huh? I'm not going to even go there. What I do want us to do right now is stand up and greet the people around us. We have uh, some visitors, so let's make sure to introduce, introduce ourselves to them and get to know them. Uh, please, go ahead. Hopefully we had a little bit of a chance to love our neighbors this morning. I promise you we will do it again. If you could all have a seat for a second. We've sung this song a few times at Jacob's Well. We um, don't really, uh, haven't had a chance to teach much of it. But I invite you to either listen or sing. The choice is yours. So immature There's a lot Of life to come Let my mind My heart be opened Follow the lure of your son Teach me patience, teach me kindness I'm tired of all of this blindness I want to take flight like a dove I want to us to put away childish things you said to eat soft food
Cry these poisons from my hands That I'm holding on to That I am holding on to Teach me patience, teach me kindness I'm tired of all of this blindness I wanna take flight like a dove I wanna love You said ask for wisdom I need you in my life completed I wanna be a man Leave behind my childhood Put down this adolescent meal To eat real food Food again. Teach me patience, teach me kindness. I'm tired of all of this blindness. I wanna take flight like a dove. Blindness. I wanna take flight like a dove. I wanna love. I wanna love. I wanna love. I wanna love. Teach me the world. Stand. of your love you had me in before and behind the heavens are your home the heavens are your home the deep is your design the deep is your design from your presence I Never hide from your presence. I can never hide. Yeah, isn't this the of your love You had me in before and behind The heavens are your home The heavens are your home The deep
deep is your design From your presence I can never hide From your presence I can never hide From your presence I can never hide Isn't this the way can hold the measure to your love who can hold the measure to your love sing that who can hold the measure to your love who can hold the measure to your To a measure, to a measure, to your love. Isn't this the the way you are with us God your love just blows our, our minds away so God I just ask that you would pour out your love upon us unite us help us to see our our similarities more than our differences help us to love one another it's in your name that we pray Amen. You may be seated. Hi, I'm Greg Meyer, the pastor here for Jacob's Well. And um, those of you who were here back in August, remember this milk carton and this board? If you weren't, well, um, I guess I can tell you about it. Uh, this is uh, something here for those of you who want to understand what it means to be, live the life uh, that Jesus leads us to. So, sorry folks, it's something I don't like to have to do to you, but um, it's a day for all of us to get out of our comfort zones a little bit, including me. Okay, so let me explain. First of all, I got this end of the board. This end of the board here is my way or the highway Christianity, okay? There is no way to salvation except the way I do it and the way I understand it. Got that? Okay. On this end of the board, we have, see if I can make it, we have all roads lead to Rome. All faiths are equal, 
Uh, they are just different. It really doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you believe. Okay? Now, it's nice to be on one end or the other. As you can see, I'm much more comfortable. This is pretty solid. I can stand here. I don't have to think too much about it. I can just kind of go through life. Unfortunately, life isn't lived here, nor is life lived here. <laughs> yes, keep praying, folks. <laughs> Where is life lived? Life is lived right here in the middle. In the middle. Where we have to ask some tough questions. Where our equilibrium is challenged where our worldview is stretched, and where, most importantly, it's tough enough to do it that I realize I have to rely on God daily for wisdom, for guidance, and for strength. Okay? Probably rather not do it, but this is where I've got to be. God calls us here in the middle. In the middle here, I have to take Jesus seriously. Jesus matters. Jesus said, uh, he, I am not just an option, I am the Son of God, and I've got to deal with it. I've got to figure out what that means for my life. And when I begin to deal with it, I find out that it changes my life and that it becomes the message of my life. On the other hand, while I'm also here in the middle, I realize that not everybody's experience with the Christ that came here to transform our world in a relationship with God experiences Christ the same way I do. And not only will I spend my life trying to understand what Jesus means for me, I will spend my life and I will never quite understand what Christ is meaning for some other people. Now, as I said, God calls us to live here in the middle. And... Um, that isn't the easiest place to be, but here we are. Is that enough of that metaphor for now? <laughs> Before I kill myself? Um, you know, now most of us live on one end or the other, or pretty darn close to it, because, you know, life is just too hard to be there in the middle all the time. Um, in fact, most churches only off, offer one option or the other. Here at Jacob's Well, we try to help you to live in the middle. We know it's hard, and so, you know, when you get tired, hold on to me. That's one of the reasons we come here every week. When I'm tired, I'm going to hang on to you. And together we can do this. Now, there are a couple of clues that God has given us for those of us who want to know this God in the middle, this God who refuses to be compromised, but yet also refuses to be contained in a box. And the first clue that we have to all of that is that God is bigger than God is narrow. That's a feeling. If you look at the back of your Sunday paper, you're going to see an outline there. And we, we use these as a way to kind of help with the learning and be able to take some things home with you. But God is bigger than God is narrow. Now, what does that mean? It means that instead of looking at, at what God does not embrace, God's narrowness, we look at what God does embrace. God's bigness, God's greatness, God's immensity. This is abundance thinking, not scarcity thinking. This is the way the creator of the universe would want us to think. God is big. We'll talk more about that in two weeks from now. But let me mention just two aspects of this. First, the most amazing thing about God is how good God is. You can fill that in too, how good God is. You know, the more I read the Bible, the more I experience God in my own life and grow with Christ, the more I see other people living with Christ through tragedies and through some wonderful things in their life, I am struck over and over and over by one consistent factor. God is good. Now, do you know um, the most often repeated phrase in the Bible? It's this one right here. Say that with me. God's steadfast love endures forever. 132 times in the Bible that, that phrase is repeated word for word. God's steadfast love endures forever. You know what that says to me? If there's anything true in the Bible, that's it. God's steadfast love is, endures forever. It lasts forever. Uh, now, God is extravag extravagantly good. From the number of stars in the heavens we see to the fact that God provides a planet that can support at least six billion people if we would just be a little bit more civil with one another. Um, and that despite our circumstances, God promises a life of fulfillment, of contentment, even though we don't earn it, even though we don't deserve it. All we have to do is trust God to be giving it to us. Amazing grace, the Bible calls it, as well as the song. There's nothing more amazing than this undeserved love that God has for us. So if you are ever wondering about like, who is in the kingdom of God and who is out of it, expect to be surprised by this characteristic of God's. And Jesus, over and over, was amazing people with how good he was to them. Whether it was the unrepentant tax collector, the woman caught in adultery, whether it was the criminal on the cross, Jesus reached out and accepted and loved people, often before they ever asked it, always before they deserved it. 
And it is this extravagant goodness of God's that is the reason that God loves you, too. Not because you deserve it, either. God is bigger than God is narrow. Now, the second thing that we know about how um, God is bigger than God is narrow is that God's truth leaks from everywhere. Now, that's technical um, theological language, but I think you can figure that one out. God's truth leaks from everywhere. See, God wants to be known. The immensity of God means that there is no body of human knowledge or compilation of wisdom, no organized religion that can ever encompass all that God wants to be for us, all that, what, all that God wants to reveal to us. It seeps out of every pore of our world. The Psalms tell us the heavens are declaring the glory of God. The stars, the planets. See, God's wonder and truth are woven into the very fabric of the universe. It isn't a secret for someone to discover and decipher, but a gift in plain sight that is intended to lead us to this relationship of trust and hope. Trust and hope in God, not upon ourselves. It shouldn't threaten us, therefore, if we get glimpses about our faith that seem to teach us things we didn't realize before that come from other sorts of sources. Maybe from a scientist. Maybe from a good person. Maybe from someone who follows another religion. They can't help but have some of God's truth. God's truth leaks from everywhere. That's how big and how God and how big and how good God is. And it all points us to one simple thing. How big and great and all encompassing our God is, and how desperately God wants to know us. We should be eager learners of this truth that seeps from the pores of the universe, not threatened and frightened protectors of yesterday's understandings. Now, the second piece to living in the middle um, fits rather nicely with what we talked about last week, if you were here, and that is you are a witness, not a judge. A witness, not a judge. John 3.16, you know, that one at football games, I always hold up the placards. It says, For God so loved the world that God sent God's only beloved Son that whoever trusts in him would be saved. That's been used countless times to make people choose Jesus out of fear of what would happen if they didn't. Okay, But that verse doesn't stand on its own. It's followed by John 3.17, surprise, surprise, which says, For God did not send him to the world to judge the world, but to save it. You know, on that verse, on your outlines, cross out the word judge, circle the word save. That's the important thing. That's what God wants us to know about Jesus. Folks, if, Jesus, if it wasn't Jesus' job to come here and to judge other people, why do we do it? I mean, what do you know that Jesus didn't know? He came to love people, to point people to God, to be healing in people's lives, to save. Why do we think it's our do- job to judge? It isn't. Now, last week we talked about being witnesses. Witnesses. What are they? They are people who tell what they have seen. Where have you seen God in your life? How do you know that God loves you and has accepted you despite the basket case that you are? Huh? Tell it. This is good news. This is the best news. It is what can reclaim your life. It is what can give you purpose when you have none. It is the, the key to strength of this God who died on a cross for you. Sharing it doesn't mean that the other person's life is bankrupt. No, you don't have to knock down someone else's house to show them yours. It just lets them know the goodness where you have seen God's truth. What God does with it is God's job and God's power in your life. Imagine talking with someone from a different spiritual background. Suppose that person doesn't respect your point of view at all and doesn't want to listen to you. And so all you can do is listen to that person and listen deeply. And that is what they experience from you. You are accepting them. You are listening to them, perfect or imperfect as they may be. Guess what? You just witnessed to that person. You modeled a Christ-like attitude towards them. And God can use that to touch their life, to move them to the next step of whatever it is in God's agenda for that person, much more than God could ever use the wall that you erected by insisting that your knowledge and your understanding is superior to theirs. Side note. Um, well, I'll get back to that in a minute. Just remember, you are a witness, not a judge. Okay? The third thing is God is in the business of transforming 
Everything can fill that in. Everything. God is in the business of transforming everything. To say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, which is what we're talking about today, is to say that Jesus has authority over everything. All right? Are you with me there? That means nothing in the world is quite what God would have it be, but God wants to transform everything. And when we say everything, we mean everything. That includes our own religion. Now, a note, what is a religion? A religion is a human construct that we try to use to capture a relationship that God intends for us. God offers a relationship to us. We create, we make it into a religion, all right? That doesn't mean religions are bad. It just means they are never quite the real thing. They are simply trying to express the relationship. Now, every, re- every religion has chinks in its armor, and it can be used... Um, earnestly to seek after the heart of God, or it can be used with our own agenda to go after purposes that are certainly a lot less than God would have them for and often even lead to evil in our world. But when the way, the truth, and the life of God breaks into anything, it turns it upside down. It transforms it. There's a verse in the Bible. I love this one. It says, All of creation groans as if it were in labor for what God is up to in it. All creation groans as if it were in labor for what God is up to in it. Ouch. That's what it feels like. When God not only comes in to transform the messed up stuff that you have, but God comes to transform the best stuff that you have. Now, I have never been through child labor, but I know two things about it. One, it hurts. Some nodding heads there. Two, it brings forth life. And that's what God is up to. See, God's practice of remaking, transforming everything means that we need to be humble about what we know and honest about the fact that we don't know everything. We need to be tolerant and open. We don't have to accept everything. Not everything is of God. That's also true, okay? We're living in the middle, not one end or the other. But fear of that should not drive us from the confidence that God is able to use all things taken together for good for those who love God. Now, we've got to practice this. Um, we don't want to just talk about it. We have two very special guests here today, Mariam Mohammed and Abdus Salam Adam. Would you come and join me up here? They know an awful lot about this uh, great big God and their faith and how they practice it from the perspective of Islam and about their people, and uh, they're going to share some things. And they're really very distinguished guests. We're quite honored to have them with us, and there's some information about them in your Sunday papers, and I'll just leave that for you to read. Um, But um, go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to pull up another stool here. But Abdeslam, let me just begin with you. Um, We all, I think, know a little bit about Islam, but probably... Not very much. Can you kind of give us the three-minute crash course? Okay. Well, three-minute class. Is it on? Is the microphone on? Yep. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. You just keep talking. I'll I'll mess with this. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Basically, um, we'll probably use some of the slides there, so... You know, to make it brief, so please, next slide. Um, what we have here is the Islamic greeting of peace, which is Assalamu Alaikum. Can you all say Assalamu Alaikum? That's the greeting of peace, and the response is the one at the bottom of the slide, which is Wa Alaikum Assalam. Wa Alaikum Assalam. Okay, next slide, please. This is basically the definition of the root of the word Islam, it comes from an Arabic word that means um, to surrender or to submit to God. And the religion is called Islam. And it means there are many derivatives of the word Salm, like Abdi Salam, for example, my name is the servant of the peaceful God. The greeting is Salam Alaikum, which means peace be with you. So that concept is very important in this religion. Next, please. And then the next word we have is the word Muslim, and this is one who submits to God, to one who surrenders himself to God. And Islam is a worldwide religion, people of all faiths, and it's in all continents and all countries. Next, please. Then here we have the Muslim population. Uh, it's about 1.5 uh, uh, 
billion Muslims, and the majority are not from the Arab world, contrary to what many people believe. So it's only about 18% of the Muslim world is Arab, of, from the Arab world. Next, please. Then uh, this is the worldwide Muslim population. Um, the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, those countries have the most. And Africa, the Arab world, some in China. And again, um, in the U.S. there are about 6 to 7 million Muslims. And in Minnesota we have about 100,000 Muslims, that kind of growing community. More than 60% are from the Somali community. Next, please. And this map is just showing us again the slides. And the green, dark green is where the countries that have majority Muslim. And the light green is the next, and that's how it continues. Next, please. Next slide, yes. And this is the U.S. Uh, Muslim population. Out of the 7 million, the majority are African-American. And the next group is the Indian subcontinent and the Arab countries. So this is the majority of the Muslim population in the U.S. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, that's about it, I think. So this is basically, uh, yeah, this is the basic information, but the other thing I would like to share is um, Islam uh, is a world religion, and basically the reason that God is calling uh, humankind is to worship him and to serve him and to be constructive. And so this is, again, Muhammad is the prophet of Islam. He grew up as an orphan uh, in a long chain of prophets that, according to Muslims, started with Adam, continued up to Muhammad, and many of the biblical prophets are also within Islam. He was poor, he was an orphan, he was unlettered, and at the age of 40 was when he received the revelation to start the message. Next, please. These are the basic beliefs of Islam. So when it comes to the belief system, these are called the six uh, articles of faith. So believe in one God, believe in angels, the same angels as Christianity and Judaism, the prophets, 25 of them are mentioned in the Quran, there are holy books, the the Torah, the Gospel, the Psalms of David, the Quran, these are also holy books. They say, believe in the day of judgment, that this world is temporary and there's a hereafter and there's accountability. And the last one is divine faith, that God predetermines and kind of oversees everything that we do and say. And the last slide is the five pillars of Islam. I think we've all heard about this and we have seen them at different levels. So the declaration of faith which is, uh, basically relies on the oneness of God and the unity of God. And then the five daily prayers, um, giving charity to the poor, called zakat. And then fasting in the month of Ramadan, no food, no drink, from, uh, dust, uh, from sunrise to sunset. So through the daytime, nothing whatsoever. And the last one is pilgrimage to Mecca, when Muslims from all over the world gather for an annual pilgrimage, and it's a kind of... Uh, brings out the message of humanity. People from all countries, from all continents, of all colors, all coming together in a piece of land. And that's more than five minutes, I guess. That's no, I, I think that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. Now, there's a lot more to be known, obviously. And actually, there's um, some brochures out at the information table on your uh, way out. So please feel free to pick one up and kind of get a little more detail, and you can talk to them as well. But, Mariam, um, as a as a Somalian Muslim woman here in the United States, in a country particularly that's predominantly Christian, uh, what, what's that like? Can you t share with us a little bit? Okay. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have to say um, Islam, for me, uh, as Abdul Salam explained uh, clearly, is a religion. And as Christianity is a religion, and I, I enjoyed your talk today of let's not box ourselves. I think it's not a hard thing for a Muslim person to live in here because Muslims, we believe in Jesus. And so if you don't believe in Jesus, you are not a Muslim. And so um, it's a place where I can worship. And uh, Muslims, uh, we don't have to go to mosque. Uh, Islam, you can really worship God anywhere. As Abdul Salam said, it's a mission of yourself. So you, you live your life every day. So you can pray anywhere you want, uh, and, and you really, so America allows you to do that. What's hard for me as a Muslim is September 11, where uh, you hear a lot of uh, stories that really doesn't represent the religion itself and the people, and so that has been hard for me. Um, 
Well, can you just share with us a little bit on how, how it really changed for you after September 11th, either one of you? Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I mean, generally speaking, um, I think Minnesota in particular and the U.S., um, Muslims are really grateful to be here. And the level of acceptance and interaction and acceptance to diversity, I mean, the, the, the parable that you shared this morning was amazing. I mean, uh, you, know, the, you know, just seeing how people should not be so rigid and so predetermined. So basically, Muslims uh, started coming to the country, some of them quite early, uh, and many of the you know, African-American slaves were Muslim, and then in the, in the 1920s, 1930, there were people who came from Lebanon and Syria and so on. And then in the 60s, students began to come. So um, generally, the community was growing and kind of uh, a lot of it very professional. Then after September 11, of course, a lot of things changed, and it's understandable. I mean, that was really you know, devastating and uh, totally unacceptable by any standard, even within uh, the, the, the teachings of Islam. So, um, of course, people kind of questioning, can we really trust, you know, these people? Um, suspicion in, in the schools or your neighbors. And so those were pretty much visible. And uh, we did get many complaints. And um, my own personal experience, generally, I was kind of engaged in dialogue and meeting with public officials and law enforcement and kind of trying to uh, uh, you know, build bridges and kind of uh, contain the situation. And that itself also was very... Uh, good and generally the experience was good, but the only one experience that I had—I mean, it's just for—I'm not saying it's bad or whatever—but I think the second day after September 11th, and I'm a teacher in St. Paul's School, so actually I was in a classroom when the uh, when it happened, and I had no clue. I was in my regular class, and I saw people, you know, upset and walking around. And when I came out, I said, what's going on? And that was how I found out about it. I was teaching in the middle. And so the students and discussion and about it, and so I was very much, you know, part of that uh, understanding. Then I was in a store, and then a gentleman walked up to me, "Hey, guy, are you practicing flying planes or something?" <laughs> so you know, I didn't really take it, you know, you know, under the circumstances. Just have to understand and, you know, uh, perceive it. And but things are kind of more tighter. Immigration, um, tr you know, trust level is really shaky with the political situation, so we just need to really work harder and try to build bridges more. I think it, you know, it's one of the truths that we have a tendency to always lump people that we don't understand very well into one group, and I think we as people that follow Jesus feel maybe not real thrilled to always be lumped into the same basket as some other people who also claim to be doing that, and it's not real fair for us to do that to the Islamic community as well. Uh, you know, we, you talked a little bit about some of uh, the similarity, for instance, that we you know, both understand Jesus as an important role in our understanding of God and so on. But um, are there some differences, or you would say maybe some um, realizations or insights within Islam that you think would be really good if Christians, by and large, would also be able to understand this or embrace this? Will you go, Maria? Go ahead. Go first. <laughs> well, I think one thing... Um, uh, I think it's so good to know the statistics because I think majority of, of uh, the Western world, they think of Islam and it's the Middle East. And so, uh, I mean, I'm so happy to see, even I didn't know that the statistics that I saw in here. And the other thing is really the, the looking and filtering Islam through uh, what we see, for example, in Saudi Arabia, that women have no rights. Um, you hear all this polygamy that Muslims can marry four wives. I don't know if it's some, some people actually asking me if they can marry ten wives. So these are things I like, you know, my colleagues, you know, people in the Western world to really, especially those who are educated, to really go out and, and learn, and that's not the case, and uh, that how Islam, uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, he was 40 years old, and he married a woman who was older than him. Uh, and that is happening. It's now at the thing in the Western world, but that, that's what he did. And women are well respected in Islam. And this polygamy you hear is really, if a, some Muslim women, men are following it, it's very hard to marry another wife because the restrictions are, four restrictions or five, Abdul Salam is the religious guy. I'm not religious. He can correct me. But one is if you are married to a woman and she, get, and she gets sick, so, um, and so she cannot sleep with you uh, because she got sick and cannot have children with you. Instead of divorcing her, uh, religion says you need to take care of her and you are allowed to marry another woman, which is reasonable. The second one is, um, I think, um, 
what was it? I completely forgot. The second one, I think, is uh, if she died. Or no, if, if she cannot have children, if she's sick. And the other restrictions are you have to really love them equally if you are marrying uh, uh, more than one and give them and be fair to them equally, which is very hard to do. We're all human. We cannot love two people at the same, at the same way. So that, that shows you how religion restricts uh, really men to take another wife. It's not like she put five bounds and then you can marry another skinny one. That's not... <laughs> That's not, that's, what it, that's not what it is. So I hope that you understand that. And also, the story, the books that you read in, in Muslim through the, you know, here in the Western world is someone who went to Saudi Arabia and they wrote a book about how it, Muslim women is, are so devastated. They, you can't see their faces. They cannot drive. But that's not the case. And, you know, Muslim women, I think uh, there, was, uh, there are Muslim women who are presidents. There are Muslim Benazira Mabutu, who was a graduate from Harvard U University, was a, a prime minister in Pakistan. These are Muslim women uh, that the Western world are still working hard for, uh, for women to be a president. So I like you guys to know those kind of things. I'll add a bit. Yeah, I'm, I think what the message we need to kind of get is uh, the, the Muslim faith itself is not monolithic. We have worldwide religion. People do bring in their own cultural uh, practices, something that's specific to them. So we can say uh, some of the teachings or practices that we see, some of them may be from the Quran or the Islamic teachings directly. Some of them may be due to culture of that particular area, and Muslims in the next country may not even agree with, with them. And some of them are neutral. It's neither sanctioned nor you know, denied by the faith. So we have all this in the, in the practices. and. And so as we deal with this community, we just need to kind of navigate and see that differences and a Somali Muslim practices may be different from an Indonesian Muslim, for example. So that idea of, uh, of diversity within the Muslim community is also something that we need to comprehend and don't lump out, you know, the whole group together. And uh, so that's my take. Yeah. Um, we got lots of good questions here. I'm going down to the fourth one. How can moderate Islam prevail over extremist jihadist Islam? Can non-Muslims affect that debate? And by the way, if you do have questions on sticky notes too, I think there's some people that I'll kind of walk up and down the aisles, or if, if you haven't done it, please do so. Sure. Uh, I'll take on yeah, that. That's, um, a, that's a loaded one for you. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah I think, um, I mean, listening to the message this morning that uh, Pastor uh, Greg delivered, it's very much, I felt like I was in a mosque. I mean, it's pretty much the same message that we hear and we receive both from the Quran, the, the Islamic holy book, and the the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, which, this, which are the two main sources of Islamic law. So um, an essential component of Islamic law or faith is moderation in religion or in everything. So extremism on either end is frowned upon. Even extremism in a religious sense, or extremism even in the, in the dogma, in the creed of the faith itself is frowned upon. So um, there's always that middle course, and there are verses of the Quran that mention that. There are many of the statements of the Prophet Muhammad. So moderation is always what uh, Islam calls you know, for people to practice. And, and so the, the, the concept of uh, uh, political uh, politicizing and going to extremism, and, um, and some of the basic facts that we need to understand in Islamic faith is suicide is forbidden. For a person to take his or her own life is clearly forbidden in the faith. Um, going extremes to, to kill people who are innocent and peaceful is completely forbidden. Taking an innocent life is, is, is totally forbidden. Uh, clear statements of the Quran. So what we are seeing and what people are doing is contrary to the teachings of their faith. And, and so the, um, the Muslims who really understand the faith in this way do speak up, but probably our, the mediums that we have is probably not as powerful as that it's able to reach everybody. But in the community, in the imams, for example, or the faith leaders, some of the national organizations, they do speak out, they do try to get this message out. So I think that needs to be strengthened. And another one is addressing the socio-economic or political situations in the Muslim world. Of course, many of the Muslim countries are in a, in a, in a volatile situation. A lot of young people who are angry, who don't have... Uh, um, uh, resources or employment and so on. So they take that anger to their own government and then 
they extend it to the United States that the U.S. is the one that's keeping whatever. So it's not justifiable. It's not really uh, um, something that they have a reason to, 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 to go to the extreme means. So I think that concept of social justice, uh, economic justice, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, addressing the root causes of these issues would be uh, very important. And I would say American Muslims do have a very important role to play. So I think what we should try to do is to reach out to um, many of them. They do have influence in their countries. We have the elite of the Muslim world from all countries, highly educated, you know, very efficient. So kind of partnering with that community and um, making sure that American Muslims themselves get, you know, integrate and, you know, get into mainstream and, you know, take that voice back to their countries. I think that also will be, uh, will be very important. So um, the, the main uh, thing I would say is, of course, pointing out the teachings of the faith and at the same time taking uh, practical steps of integrating and understanding and, uh, and really um, uh, paying attention also to the political, military situation that's happening. That, that's what I think would be very important in... Mm -hmm. in, 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 in I, can I add one thing? Yeah. I think uh, one important factor is if you look at the media here, uh, they are so easy to find someone who really doesn't get and doesn't understand. I think some of the issues Abdesalan is saying, basically some of them are uh, education, lack of education is what happens. And I think the Western world politicizes it. So the media may reach someone who's crazy and not really educated in the religion itself. And that's what the world sees it, instead of really reaching out to a Muslim who's educated and, and invisible. Uh, so one way is how do we reach Muslims who are well educated, understand uh, cultures, and then give them a chance on the media instead of giving you know, some crazy person who probably have their own agenda. Right. I think in a lot of ways, um, from policies to media, we mm -hmm. fuel the extremes in a lot of places in the world rather than really supporting the people in the center that are in dialogue and trying to live in the middle and figure uh, out what it all means. And one final thought I would like to share is the complaint that Muslims often say, especially you know, in the, within our own context, is they say when a Muslim person does something terrible, right away it's uh, stuck to the religion, that a Muslim extremist did this, or a Muslim whatever jihadist. So the faith is attacked to the person right away. And that message spreads and you hear over and over and over again. Whereas if somebody from another faith or from another background does something, it's kind of contained within that person or within that situation. So that's a complaint that Muslims say over and over again that we are kind of um, uh, lumped together and everybody is held accountable for what you know, a crazy person did. So that also is something that I think we need to be cautious of and be conscious of. The, the faith is responsible for that individual's yeah. act, or we don't apply that to, right. to our own population. Just an example is the taxi driver issue. It's the target issue. and. This is, oh, why they are here if they don't want to do that? Well, only two or three guys say that. It's not the rest of the community. As well as the person at Target, maybe someone, uh, that's an individual who said that. Uh, but it's all Muslims. Now, what is to do with this Muslim? If they don't want to work here, why they are here? And so that is really, that hurts most Muslims who want to abide and be good citizens. Um, oh, we get a little... I, I didn't turn around. I have new questions here. So, um, <laughs> well, there's a reference here, the excellent book to read to help understand um, and the faith club. So I'll just let you read that on your own. Um, well, well, just throw the hard one here at top. Wasn't Muhammad a military commander that slew many as a soldier? Okay. We have, have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. okay, I'll start with the top one. Uh, was it Muhammad, a military commander that slew many as a soldier? Um, actually, um, you know, that will kind of draw us to go a little bit into his life. Um, Muhammad um, grew up as an orphan, as I said. His father died before he was born. So when he was in his mother's womb, that's when his father passed away. And then his mother passed away when he was six. So his grandfather raised him and his uncle, and that was how he grew up. And he received the revelation at the age of... He was unlettered, he didn't know how to read, he couldn't have borrowed from Ju Judaism or Christianity, and so on. So, um, in the first 13 years, after proclaiming that he's a messenger of God, his followers were persecuted. He remained in Mecca for 13 years without 
uh, calling for, uh, without establishing a state or without founding any authority. And many times his followers even had to migrate to other countries, like they made two migrations to Ethiopia. There was a Christian king that welcomed them. And then eventually he made uh, hijra or migration from Mecca to Medina. And this is kind of the turning point in Islamic history. When he went to Medina, the people there welcomed him and that's when they established a state. So um, he himself never killed a person. He himself, um, uh, uh, but, but uh, the Islamic State as it was spread and it did become military, yes, and it, it, there was a spread of the faith in the early stages, but a lot of it was defensive too, because the Roman Empire and the per Persian Empire were both very strong and they were surrounding, and they were really saying, who is this uh, you know, crazy nomad who, who, to, to say that he's a messenger of God and to start speaking for God, and so within that context that some battles took place, but he himself, he really established engagement rules for, 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 for war, he said, you know, he was admonishing the Muslim army, even when they are going to fight, that they should not uh, harm innocents, non-combatant, religious people. They should not even harm the plants and the trees that people get their food or their fruits from. And so it was within this context. So him, he himself did never uh, engage in, 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 in killing or in, in fighting or in anything, but he was really, his message was a message of... of of mercy, of kindness, and of, but of course, within that context of establishing the faith, they did fight, you know, with some of the uh, neighboring countries. Yeah. Well, fortunately, in our Christian background, there's never been any wars. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it is hard to deal with, you know, the span of, um, you know, 1,700 Sometime, years, yeah. or 1,400 years, uh, just how we perceive history, how we understand ethics and things changes, and, you know, it's part of living in the middle is knowing how to struggle with some, some of the dark sides of our own past, our own traditions, as well as, you know, how does God's light shine through those things, and yeah. those are difficult. Um, um, as we go through these, I, I one, one last question is, you talked a little bit already about, you know, or both of you have talked a little bit about dispelling some of the mis misunderstandings we have, but there's just a, some basic etiquette, and I, I think, I mean, I, all of you uh, rub shoulders with people of uh, Somalian background or people that you would understand to be probably Muslim, I assume. Uh, probably many of you don't have real significant relationships. Are there, can you give us any tips on etiquette? I mean, just so we don't offend each other, so we can understand each other. There's all kinds of little things that can help. Can you, can yeah, you well, tell us a little bit, I Mariam? Think, um, I think greeting, like shaking hands, is something some Muslim women don't do it. Not all of them. I mean, I do it but some religious, you know, women may not do it. So the cross-gender. Yeah, yeah. cross-gender. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, you know, as Abdi Salam uh, mentioned, uh, culture plays a huge role in, 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 in the faith. So for Somalis, uh, they're very hospitable people. They really are here, feel like they're guests. They lost their country. They came here with nothing. So for them, it's not for them to say anything unless someone who is from here really establishes relationships with them because they're not well established to really have a say or even welcome you. But in traditionally, Somali people are highly hospitable people and, and really welcome you and give you anything they own uh, or, or have uh, without knowing you. So they're very hospitable people and very open, you know, especially they fit Midwest because they're coming nomadic background, they're highly individualized people who can get along with anybody and not really judge people uh, because that's the life they lived. So that's one thing I will urge you is just, you know, be yourself but make sure that you don't wait for them to come as in the culture here, oh, if they don't say it, I don't know what to do, but be open and just welcome them to your community and that, that establishes the relationship. Yeah, I'll add, uh, I'll add a few comments. Um, I mean, these tips, I think, are important because sometimes very simple things can cause misunderstanding and that can be avoided and, you know, we can do without. So I'll mention a few things just for you to hear and if they come up in your life, you know, so at least maybe you'll remember. So the handshake is one of them. And it's not all. Again, we should not generalize. As we said, it's, mono, it's not monolithic. People are different levels of, you know, application of the faith. So the handshake across gender is one. Um, if you are in teaching, some of the issues that come up is, um, for example, music. There are some Muslims who don't listen to music, so they would say, we don't want our child to take the music class. If that comes up, you know, just try to understand and work around it. Um, another one that comes up is um, drawing uh, living things. It's not all Muslim, very few, but it comes up sometimes, that God created and gave the soul to human beings. So, 
um, by drawing you are competing with God's creation. So there are some Muslims who avoid that. So that also happens sometimes. Um, eye contact, especially with somebody of the opposite gender. Um, sometimes women especially will not feel comfortable if you are a male and you are talking to them. So if you see them looking away or looking down, no, don't worry, just continue the conversation. <laughs> sometimes some teachers assume that they are being rude or being disrespectful, and you know, we did hear that sometimes. So these are some of the you know, issues that, that come up, and um, you know, I think it does help if you are kind of aware, and if some, you extend your hand and somebody refuses, you know, don't be offended and just try to understand that. It's, some people do practice that. And Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to take on one more here. Um, but I haven't digested them all, I'm sorry. The, can the Quran be amended at any time by imams? And could you explain that? Is that amending or is this, is this an issue, interpreting? Yeah. Um, according to the Islamic belief, the Quran is the literal word of God. And it was revealed to the angel Gabriel used to bring it to Muhammad and he would read it to him and Muhammad would repeat after him, memorize it, and then he will share with his followers and then they wrote it down. So this is how it came. So according to Islamic belief, it cannot be changed not a single letter, not a single word. So it has to remain the way it was during that time, but it can be translated to other languages. But in terms of, in terms of changing the order or the meaning, or, or the, that, that is not allowed. No imam, no authority, nobody can interfere with that. And so that's one of the miracles of the Quran that Muslims are kind of proud of and maintain. And millions of them memorize the whole Quran by heart, even non-Arabic speaking Muslims. Many of our Somali kids memorize the whole Quran. It's something very precious that people really um, care deeply about. So um, the, the Quran remaining the way it is is very important to the Muslims, and and, and with, the, with the, so much memorization, that also assures continuity of that message. And I will just add, uh, you hear a lot of uh, the Sunni and the Shiites in the, in the Iraq war, uh, that they all share the same Quran. So the difference is that, that they're not really faith-wise different at all. Uh, so both Shia and both Muslim, I mean Sunnis uh, use the Quran as, as, as a book. Well, there is so much more here, and we will get all these questions onto our website on the blog area, So, and we'll see what we can maybe do about getting some responses to them as well. But as you can see, each one of them could be taking up the whole hour. And um, So let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, first of all, we, we thank you that you have made us one people. We find many ways to divide ourselves, and we know none of them are from you. But yet we all seek, we all strive to find what life is in that middle. And it's different for each of us and where we are and where we, uh, and where we live and the time that we are and the, the gifts, the places you have given us. Help us to realize how big you are and how great you are and how loving you are and to share that with others and not worry about taking on the job of judging but to share we have and to listen deeply to others and to find your truth as it pours into our world from those around us. We thank you today for Mariam. We thank you for Abu Salam. We thank of all the people here too that uh, bring their hopes and their dreams for us to be your one people. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We will take our offering now. There should be some bags on the far side, and they can just get past here. When it gets all the way to you, it can bring them on up to the well, and you can stick your communication cards in there as well. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you, Lord, we love you, we love you. We love you, Lord, we love you, we love you. We love you, Lord, we love you, we love you. Our songs with 
that we can all sing together no matter what and we love you lord we love you we love you and we love you lord we love you we love you we lift our voices and we lift our voices louder still our god is near our god is here and we lift our voices louder still our god is here our god is here and we love you lord we love you we love you and we love you lord we love you we love you sing that again and we love you lord we love you we love you 